Welcome back to another episode of Organic Chemistry. I'm That Chemist, and today I'm going to show you some tricks and tips about working in ChemDraw. So a lot of the time when you're working with ChemDraw, you're trying to organize stuff so you can present it to someone who should care about what you're doing. So one of the things you can do is, if you have like a column of structures, instead of just trying to like line them up slowly one by one on the crosshairs in the middle or using the grid lines, one of the things you can actually do is Control shift alt C, and that will center all of the stuff in the column into one nice and neat column. Now you can see that these aren't distributed evenly, but we're going to sort that out later. So we can do the same thing here and here. And so now we have nice and neat columns. Now let's say we forgot to do that, or we forgot what the command was. One of the things you can do is right click, and then you can do align, and it's just uh, left and right centers versus top and bottom centers. And so there's several different ways you can align stuff. So you can also align stuff to the top. So if you want the top of them to be all together, you can do Control Shift Alt T for top. The top of these will all line up or Control Shift Alt B for bottom. And then the bottom of them will all line up. And so depending on how you're presenting stuff, this can be a useful trick. Now, if you want them to appear in the middle, which is most of the time what I like to do is Control Shift Alt M. And so the middle of each of these substances is gonna be all lined together. So we'll do that for each of these rows. And then I'll show you one neat trick to get the whole thing aligned afterwards. So we got this and this. Sometimes if you can't select all of them in one go, you can hold shift and select multiple things at a time and it will remember what you've already selected. Then we can do control shift alt M, puts everything back together. And now if we just select the last three, we can do control shift alt M and we have those all together. Now it looks like I got this one a little close here, so let's move that down. So another cool trick is while you have stuff selected, if you hold shift and then you move it, it will try and only move it in one axis. So it can either move up and down or left and right. And so that's another useful thing to know if you're trying to like move stuff around your figure. Uh, you can just hold shift and then you won't have to worry about it moving diagonally as well. Okay, so now that we have all of these lined up, let's just remake sure everything's centered. And so what you can do is you can group items. And so if you do control G, or if you right click and you go to group, you can do group. And what it will do is it'll make all of these one item. So if you move it, it'll move the whole thing. So if we do that for each of these, then what we can do is we can select all three groups and do distribute horizontally. So this is control shift alt H. And so what this will do is it'll just make sure that there's an equal amount of space between these. So now that we've done that, we can ungroup all of these. And what this should do is make it so that we can start grouping them horizontally. So we can do control G, control G, control G, control G, and control G one more time. Now that we have all five of these groups, we can make sure that they're centered, which uh, we can do by doing a line in the center like this, but we can also make it so that they're distributed vertically. So now there's an equal amount of space in between. So let's ungroup all of these again. And then one last time, we're just gonna center each of these. Control Shift Alt C, Control Shift Alt C, Control Shift Alt C. And so now we have a nice neat looking figure. If we wanted to make them closer together, what we could do is just regroup and then move the whole thing. Uh, or alternatively, you could just select all and hold shift and move them until you think it looks good enough. Now, most of the time when you're making figures for a paper, they don't have to be perfect. They just have to look not terrible. So it's useful to know how to do that. Okay, now let's look at some other stuff. So sometimes when you're drawing figures, they look really derpy. And it can be annoying because you want them to look professional. But, you know, maybe you have stuff stretched out weird, like even your benzene ring might look like this. And so it's like, usually just think to restart drawing it and try and figure out a clever way to make it look good. But one of the things you can do is you can go to structure, clean up structure, and that will start cleaning it up. But if you do this several times, it'll eventually look better and better. So here you go. Now we have a reasonable looking structure. If we did this a couple more times, uh, it'll look even better. So the key command for this is control shift K. K is for a single structure. If you had a whole reaction as down here, let's say that these structures look good, which they already do. Let's say we wanted to make this whole reaction look better. Instead of doing uh, control shift K, we do control shift X, um, but we have to have things reasonably close so that ChemDraw knows we're talking about a reaction here. So control shift X, and then everything cleans up nice and neat. One of the things I like to do is have my yield centered as well. So if I do control shift alt C, that will center these two. And then if I select the whole thing and redo uh, cleanup reaction, control shift X, then it will make everything look good. So it recognizes percent yield and sometimes it doesn't know what to do. So like if we put something like benzene here, it's gonna wanna put benzene beside all the conditions, which is like not great. 
However, if we instead had benzene as a possible reagent over here, and then we do clean up reaction, it'll just add a plus sign and it'll distribute it so it looks like a nice, neat and nice reaction. Okay, so let's say that um, we're submitting to a journal which has specific publication requirements. Currently, I'm using the style that I use for all of my lectures, which I have called that chemist style. If you want access to that chemist style, you can just join the Discord. And in the resources section, uh, the resources channel of the Discord, I have that available for free. And so I'd be happy to share that with you if you'd like to use it. But let's say we're submitting a, an article to Angavanta. So uh, Elsevier has their own publication style. Uh, so does uh, Wiley. And so if we do a Wiley document, we can modify existing. And these will all convert all of the structures in this document to the style of uh, Wiley in this case. Now let's say we wanted to instead make it ACS 1996, which is one of the most common ones that you see in all the journals, and you can see that it's just slightly smaller. So for each of the different styles, there's different bond thicknesses, bond lengths, uh, atom font sizes, etc. And so it can be useful to have a variety of these. Now personally, I prefer to just use uh, the style that I built, which is uh, based off of Totally Synthetic with some modifications. Totally Synthetic is available online as well. That's just one that someone created, and I'll put a link to that in the description. Um, but the That Chemist style is what I prefer. And so you can see we just uh, opened a new window here. Okay, so let's undo what we just did. Great. So what else was I going to show? So one of the things you can do is predict uh, NMR in ChemDraw. So the predicted NMR that you get isn't necessarily the most authoritative and it's not gonna be super accurate, but it can be better than nothing. So if you go to structure and predict NMR shifts after you've selected a structure, it can show you where you'd approximately expect to see peaks. Again, this is not perfect, depending on the NMR and the solvent, these peaks could change chemical shift a bunch. Uh, and this isn't a very like complicated, sophisticated prediction. It's just a simple uh, prediction that is better than nothing. Um, you can also zoom in more and more on these and you can actually see that this is a TIFF file, it's a scalable vector. So if you copy this, you can zoom in more using other programs. Okay, so this isn't perfect, but it's like pretty useful. So you can also do this with carbon NMR, which I'll just briefly show you here. Here's a carbon NMR for this boronic acid derivative, and you can see approximately where you'd expect to see these carbons. Now, I would say that overwhelmingly, it's a pretty useful uh, tool. However, for thiocarbonyl compounds that I've tested, the carbon NMRs and the proton NMRs have just been totally wrong. Okay. So one other thing that you quite often want to do is you've built a structure in ChemDraw. Now you want to have it in SciFinder or Reaxis. So the easiest way to do that is to do edit, copy as, smiles. And then in SciFinder, there's a text uh, input box where you can input smiles and it'll convert it to the structure when you click OK. But in Reaxis, if you just click on the screen and then do Control V to paste, it'll just paste from the smiles directly into the structure in Reaxis. Okay. So one other thing you quite often want to do is, let's say you're running high-res mass spec on something like this bromide here, and you want to know uh, what what the correct mass would be. So you can view the analysis window, which is just to reiterate, you go view analysis window. You can see here it shows the formula, the exact mass, and so this is going to be the exact mass for this compound unprotonated. So this would be the type of mass that you'd see if you, for instance, had like GCMS. However, if you, if it's ionized, there should be a net positive charge. So if we just put a positive charge, we'll lose the mass of an electron in the exact mass that you see. So you can see this is the exact mass with the loss of an electron. If I put this somewhere like near the oxygen, it's going to think the oxygen's protonated. Um, so I'm just showing it separately for clarity. So you can see here we have 9284. With this whole thing, we have the same amount. So it didn't make any significant difference in this case. So this can be useful if you want to see for instance, let's say we had an ESI high-res mass spec and we were expecting to see an M plus H peak. So in this case, we can do this and we can go paste and it will paste the exact mass. If we wanted to do something like a sodium adduct, which you quite often want to do if you're doing high-res LCMS, which has ESI. Now, the difference here is while it's all selected, it will show the correct high-res mass spec, but as soon as you try and paste it, it will show two separate masses. And so just like we were grouping these structures earlier, if we do control G and we group it, then when it does the math, it will do it for the whole adduct. So it's important to group stuff first. Um, another useful thing is, let's say we had a reaction. So let's say we had some sort of salt. Like let's say we had an anion of this cyclopentane, and let's say we had lithium plus, and we were pretending that lithium is more ionic than it actually is. So let's say we had a reaction like this, where it was reacting with something like NBS, 
and we were getting bromocyclopropane or bromocyclopentane as our product. So if we had a reaction like this and we tried to do cleanup reaction, control shift X, it's kind of annoying because it separated the lithium and the cyclopentane anion as to separate things. And so what you'd want to do is you want to group these together, control G, and then you can clean up the reaction and it'll do it properly. Okay, so another thing you can do is if you're showing a mechanism, you often want to draw arrows. So let's say we had uh, an N compound here. We'll just put two R groups for the two carbonyls of succinamide and we wanted to show a mechanism. So there's normal arrows here in the arrow window where you can show an arrow like this. This is quite often fine. However, there's a manual arrow drawing tool, which is a pen. And so these take a little bit more practice to use, but if you draw where you want the curve to go to, um, you can draw it like this. Um, so this would be at the start. If we wanted to have it at the end, we could do it here. You can move this around. You can point the arrow however you want. Um, additionally, if you want to change the thickness of the arch, you can do that too. And here you can see that this is just going to uh, give us a little bit of extra stuff we don't need right now. So there's there's several different ways to draw arrows. I mostly don't use the pen draw on arrows, but they look a lot better for complex angles. So like, let's say you're trying to like weave your way around a complex molecule, the pen drawn arrows are best. Okay, so aside from that, that's the majority of what I'm hoping to cover today. If you'd like me to do another chem draw tutorial video in the future, I'd be happy to do that. And I hope you have a great day.